This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast brought to you by Site Visibility. I'm your host, Scott Colnut, and with me today is John Helmer, host of the Learning Hack Podcast, and also a writer and learning enthusiast in general. And we're going to be discussing the evolution. So how e-learning is evolving, the evolution of e-learning. Something that's really interesting to me, I spend a lot of time in e-learning online courses. I'm very interested in self-development and I'm particularly curious. I don't know any different. So e-learning as we know it today is the only e-learning I feel like I know. But John has an incredible history in the e-learning space and so I'm sure it'll be interesting to go back over what's happened in e-learning in the past and how we got to today. So welcome to the podcast, John. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. It's a great honour. No problem. And just as a starting point, I mentioned there, you've written about e-learning, I've seen downloadable content, your Learning Hack podcast, but could you give our listeners a bit of a self-introduction and explain maybe where your fascination with e-learning and the e-learning space, yeah, where did that start? Sure. I'm a um, showrunner and host of the Learning Hack podcast, as you mentioned, but also the Great Minds on Learning podcast, uh, which is about learning theory. Uh, learning Hack has been going for two years. Uh, Great Minds on Learning just started um, this autumn, and I'm getting used to the idea of running two podcasts at once, which, let me tell you, is no mean feat. <laughs> uh, so I present Great Minds with Donald Clark, author, blogger, and entrepreneur. He will be known to anybody in the learning space. He's a worldwide authority. Uh, aside from that stuff, I'm also a marketing consultant working with tech companies in learning and education. And I've done that on behalf of some of the leading companies in the space over the last 20 years. It was a much smaller industry when I began, and now it just gets bigger every year. I'm also a published novelist with a musical past. I've been on top of the pops. I won a Perrier Award and made a series of mini musicals for Channel 4. That's always a long time ago. So my personal goals really are to contribute in some small way to the sum of human understanding and happiness and not to bore anybody. Um, <laughs> and learning has been, as you can see, it's a bit of a portfolio career. I've chopped and changed a lot. I've had to learn a lot of stuff along the way. Um, and it seems like I'm continuously reinventing and reskilling myself. So learning is really important for that, just to keep the mortgage paid, but nothing else. Hmm. And that's what I'm really interested in about, the commitment to self-development. Uh, like you said, the continuous reinvention that requires a level of discipline and a level of continuous learning. And I've got a note in front of me where kind of in my research I've written down, it's very meta to be speaking to someone that studies learning. So you're learning, you're constantly speaking to people and learning about the topic of learning. And I've been, as I said, I'm really interested in this topic, but I found myself in a space where I'm continuously, particularly as a podcast host, learning lots and lots about topics and then really struggling to apply my learning. And so I'm kind of caught in this constant battle of learning and not being able to apply the learning. And so I feel like in this theoretical mud <laughs> that I'm stuck in, I'm just wondering if that's a thing that you hear about often when you're studying e-learning and whether it's something you've experienced yourself. Yeah, I kind of know what you're talking about <laughs> as a marketing person, because even before I was podcasting, I, I ran a magazine for a couple of years for, for a client, uh, which was based around interviews. So I'd, I'd have to kind of get up to speed with the topic very quickly and in some depth in order to be able to interview people. Mm. Um, and then it'd be over and done. And maybe when I write white papers as well, there's a good deal of research needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But my kind of marketing brain is sort of to get very deep into that stuff. And then as soon as I've um, written the blog post or the white paper or whatever, or the magazine article, instantly forget about it. Empty my brain out, make room for more stuff to come in. Otherwise, you you just haven't got the storage, you know. Uh, just moved house and the storage problems after, you know, living in the same house for 20 years are just absurd. I think you have the same thing with your brain. Now, Learning about learning, which I've been doing for great minds of, on learning, has is, is kind of enabled me to reflect on this because I can see there are certain type of learning that you do is learning skills that you want for the rest of your life or knowledge that you want to go very deep into long-term memory. 
And that is a different kind of mental process, I think. Um, and so, so learning about learning has enabled me to make that distinction. Uh, Scott, I wouldn't beat myself up about that behavior you're talking about because I, I actually think it's quite a useful thing. But actually learning is a, is a different process. And I've found stuff like learning to edit and um, to engineer, to audio engineer, you know, really quite difficult being a bit older. And I'm very aware now of the processes I'm following when I, when I do that. And I, I think learning about learning has enabled me to do that better. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting insight and maybe only some, something that comes over a long period of kind of self-analysis and study. I definitely have experienced what you just alluded to there, beating myself up about. I think this really comes from the marketing aspect of who I am and maybe just today's society where everything is action orientated and the culture in marketing of hustle and the kind of the grind. And you forget that actually just the habit of learning is just a really important skill and it should be relaxing it should it doesn't have to always be applied learning it might benefit you in ways that you don't suspect and aren't immediate um so i really appreciate kind of hearing that perspective on it and actually just talking about over a long period of time and e-learning as a starting point i mentioned at the beginning there that i've kind of got a narrow view on e-learning i think because i'm a millennial I've started using e-learning platforms within the last 10 years or so. And so for me, my perspective on e-learning and where it's at today is just that, you know, there's a wealth of information at our fingertips. There are 10 to 15 major e-learning platforms that we can all go learn from. And I really don't have too much of a historical context about what it was like before this time. So maybe could you Speak on maybe how the major evolution changes in e-learning over the last 20 years or so and what got us to this point today. As you mentioned, the, the e-word e-learning, probably the 60s is the place you start. Um, and e-learning starts really when computers start to come into academic environments, you know, university departments, they would have departments of computing and these big mainframe systems arrived. And there was some really interesting work done very early on, um, notably at the University of Illinois, uh, a project called PLATO, which is an acronym. can't pretend I remember or <laughs> I've learned what that stands for. Uh, there's a very good book about this called The Friendly Orange Glow, which anyone who's interested in this stuff can, you know, should really pick up because they did some really innovative stuff. They invented a learning system on these mainframe room-filling computers, which were networked to kind of, you know, thin client terminals that they put in nearby schools and they could do personalization social collaborative learning games-based learning sophisticated interactivity and adaptive learning tracking of every keystroke made by the learner for analytics leaderboards branch simulations almost everything that would be you know even seems quite innovative in a system nowadays was mm. in existence at that point and I, I was really quite startled when i looked back at that However, that wasn't what sparked the birth of the e-learning industry, strangely enough. You have to go forward to 1981 to that, and it was the, the release of the IBM PC, uh, those desktop computers, that really made the big change because you've got kind of entrepreneurs in the business space starting to say, well, you know, organizations, they all need language courses, they need basic skills courses, and uh, people like Clive Shepard and Donald Clark started making this stuff on PCs and selling it to org big organizations. You know, of course, it's on floppy disks and so on then. And, and then with kind of Moore's Law driving the process year after year, there was more bandwidth rate available, uh, better storage media. You moved on from kind of floppy disks to CDs eventually mm. and so on. Uh, and at the same time, computers arrived within organizations. They began to be networked through LAN networks and eventually the internet came on stream and you started to get software suites so more compli complex types of software so e-learning began to respond to that and you began to get the first learning management systems i think most people will know what a learning management system is you know at school they might have had moodle or your you know vle at, at university or whatever the first learning management system was invented by ibm back in the 30s and they sold it to the nazis 
um, but we made sure a veil over that. So the learning <laughs> management system goes out f- back further than you think as well. But the e-learning industry really gets going in the year 2000, and it's been mm. called the Cambrian Explosion um, of e-learning, uh, which is kind of a reference to you know fossils and so on. But this is when the industry really arrives. And there was a notable report called the Hambrecht Report, which really defined what the e-learning industry was, separated it into content services and technology. And you did have content businesses and you had technology businesses and services somewhere in the middle. It became much more of a bespoke industry than a kind of off-the-shelf industry completely, I I think. People expected it that it would be, you know, we will build courses and we will serve them over a learning management system and that will be the way that it goes. But it it really wasn't that simple. As soon as that um, model was launched in the year 2000, I I was going to shows all the time as a marketing, head of marketing then, and I'd go to the conferences and they were just full of educationalists, learning gurus pushing back on this model of e-learning around, you know, a piece of content served from a learning management system. Because I said, this has got absolutely nothing to do with the experimental literature and what that tells us about how people learn. You don't learn in a course. You learn after the course. I can talk about a bit more about that later. But that's been a kind of ongoing drumbeat. Meanwhile, uh, these learning management systems were, because of ERP, these were becoming part of the, um, the HCM, you know, the, the HR software ecosystem, because... You had to have a suite for everything. You know, finance had a suite, marketing had a suite. You know, you've got blog, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but things like Salesforce and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps we could come on back on that. It's HubSpot, isn't it? I was forgetting the name. Yep. Yeah. So everything has a suite. Marketing has a suite with HubSpot. There's Salesforce with the salespeople. The finance guys have their theirs. The HR people have theirs. And learning was sort of nested within HR. So learning management systems had to talk to all the other bits of the architecture. And that sort of changed the way that it developed. The pushback continued, though, because this is the learning systems were all about administration. They're about serving content, saving money, firing trainers so that you could send out e-learning instead, fulfill your kind of global compliance commitments as a major organization and not go broke in the process. But they had very little to do with learning theory and the stuff that I've learned so much about recently, thanks to Donald, that you don't learn in the course, you learn afterwards. Space practice, space repetition is the way that you embed stuff in long-term memory. So along comes the learning experience platform, which is different from the LMS because it focuses more on the learner. That was called by some people the Netflix of learning. Uh, because it was more about a user experience, about UX, which suddenly becomes a thing in learning, <laughs> about uh, self-directed learning, more elective learning, learning in the flow of work. Um, and this idea that actually it wasn't about one course, but you might have a variety of different pieces, you know, blended learning. So you, mm. you, you might want to keep up to date on the late, latest articles. So you have curated content and, and that sits alongside bits of courseware and so on, and you'll have tests. And you can also have sophisticated analytics. Um, So that's kind of where we are at the moment. And there there is a big variety of learning systems. You still have LMSs, you have LXPs, you have LMSs which have LXP functionality, you have LXPs that are backfilling with LMS functionality, and nobody quite knows what anything is. It's a very confusing marketplace with a very confused buyer. And it is the job of marketing people now to untangle all that and to help but, uh, the buyers understand what it is they're looking at half the time. Yeah, starting with me, because I need to break down some of that and help understand it. I'm I'm not familiar with a lot of the terminology that you just shared there, so apologies if I get it but wrong. I'm sorry if I've tied you up in three-letter <laughs> acronyms there. Yeah, I'm not too sure exactly where I'm going to get this right. But everything that you've just described there at the end and where we're at today, I assume that just bringing this to life for the the listeners that will probably listen to this podcast and be familiar with a lot of the easily accessible e-learning. Again, I don't even know how to describe it. I I refer to them as e-learning platforms. So uh, companies like Udemy, Udacity, Khan Academy, Coursera. How would you describe those just to start with what they called in in the e-learning world? Um, most of the, the ones that you've mentioned mostly come out of the MOOC 
area, so, right. which, which started in kind of higher ed, uh, people like Udacity and Khan more kind of uh, focused on schools and what the Americans call K-12. Yeah. Uh, but MOOCs kind of crossed over the barrier into the organizational market and, and changed as they did so because really everybody wants to be on the organizational side. There's more money there for a mm. start. There's also in the education space a lot more kind of entrenched conservatisms. Now, this is sometimes hard for people to understand. I mean, it's very important as a marketing person to understand your market sector. And people often think that education and, and organizational training are very similar. They're not. They're completely different. And the, the reason was explained to me by a, 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 a you know quite elderly, very distinguished consultant who'd worked in both workplace learning and education. And he said, look, between you and me, I wouldn't say this out loud on a conference platform, but it's much easier to fire a trainer than it is to fire a teacher or a lecturer. Awesome. It's more complex than that. There is a weight of institutional conservatism in in education, but it, it but it is kind of that. When e learning came in after the Cambria explosion of two thousand, um, something like fifty percent of learning and development staff lost their jobs because they were basically administrators, and the LMS picked up a lot of that. A lot of routine IT training. Immediately, those those trainers lost their jobs. They were redeployed and went and did other things. Largely, they didn't all, you know, like my next door neighbour and in my last house, um, have to to reinvent themselves as special needs teachers or and leave the industry, whatever. But that that happened. It's not talked about very much. You just couldn't contemplate a similar thing happening in education. As you were talking there, you mentioned the crucial role of the marketer in helping to. I guess helping the e-learning space or helping the student, maybe you can elaborate on this, uh, helping to differentiate what these product offerings actually are. So I'm curious if you could just elaborate that on a bit and where do you see the role as the marketer in the e-learning space and what do you think marketers have to do in the future to maybe clear up some of the confusion if this in this space, if that's the right word? Um, unfortunately, marketers tend to end up adding to the confusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... When you say, you know, explain it to the student, I don't, none of my experience has really involved end users. You know, there, mm-hmm. there is a kind of consumer market for, for learning products and learning platforms. But most in the organizational space, you are selling to a head of uh, L&D in an organization with uh, a 1,000 people upwards. And a, an organization with a 1,000 people is small fry for most e-learning companies. They really want to start around 5,000 headcount upwards. So you're you're selling to a head of an L and D. Probably your average deal is going to be somewhere in the region of kind of twenty thousand upwards to um, you may be talking millions for a a big implementation. So it's a big ticket sale, and there aren't that many people. There aren't many that many checkbooks. You know, to be frankly, I mean, it did occur to me once during my marketing career that there, when when we were assembling databases of huge numbers of people, email lists of huge number of people. And and we got past 10,000 and I was sort of congratulating myself. And I thought, actually, there's probably only a 1,000 people in the UK that we really need to speak to. But there's a halo effect. You know, you have a lot of influencers around that. And content marketing became really important because it was an important way, first off, of explaining what everything was about, you know, as we said. As it's gone on, content marketing has, tends to be a bit driven by clicks and clickbait. And you get a kind of confusion in that. I was reading an article the other day that really annoyed me. It said, um, Ebbinghaus has been overturned. Ebbinghaus is a learning theorist, very important. He came up with the forgetting curve. And he said this has been debunked. Well, well, he hasn't. I mean, you know, it's an out-and-out lie. But it, it, he got the clicks because he'd said something contentious. Now, there's a difference, I think, between content marketing and thought leadership. And I suppose as I've moved on in my career, I've done more, more thought leadership Thought leadership tends to be not focused on getting those quick quick clicks, but further down the funnel, so to speak, about engagement with clients. And I think there is a real tension there because what works for you at the top of the funnel actually is doing lots of brand destruction most of the time at the lower end of the funnel. So you've got a few number of checkbooks that you need to get close to you want deep engagement with those people, you deeply want them to engage with the ideas of your organization and your ability to explain, you know, its products 
to those people and how it fits into the context of learning and learning theory. So that is kind of the way to go if you want a long-term lasting relationship. Not everybody does want a long-term lasting relationship. They just want the clicks. But um, mm. that, that tension does exist. And I think it, it's good to be aware of that. If you really are trying to help out your sales force that are doing the solution sales, you're not going to help them with clickbait. I think that's what's interesting to me is the tension point that you note because um, I, I've discussed it on the podcast before In the from the marketing angle is there's such a thirst for that immediate lead generation or however you describe it, generating leads, generating revenue, very short-term targets. Yeah. And so typically there isn't much thought to longevity. And and what you're saying is that when it comes to thought leadership, this is a long-term decision and this is a long-term commitment, which doesn't necessarily lend itself to maybe the modern sales environment. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, mm. we, we, we did track kind of, um, when, when we were selling sort of bespoke content development um, packages and learning management systems, we looked at the kind of length of the sales cycle and it was something from first contact and an exhibition, it was somewhere between three to nine months before you actually had a sale, or as the salespeople used to colourfully put it, blood in the water, before you first got your bit of mo- first bit of money out of that, that client. But it's worth it because that first bit of money might be, you know, 20,000 quid, and then you might get another 30,000, a couple of 30,000 projects for the end of the year. And that might then again lead to a, a more wide, wide-scale kind of Im- implementation. On the other hand, I really do sympathise with people who've got sales forces who are crying out for leads and have to get them quickly and it's kind of a volume game Mm. because really in in a sense it is a volume game you know you need to talk to a lot of people to to get to those few narrow down to the ones who actually are going to buy what what you have to sell i mean it's not easy but if you can get your sales force working with marketing on developing those clients uh, I found I, I forged some very productive relationships with salespeople because, you know, not only were they grateful for the for the stuff we were uh, supplying them with that they could engage clients with um, thought leadership materials, but also they were your eyes and ears on the clients and you found out so much about the, the market from them, you know. And th- this is a really fundamental thing that, that marketing people need to know, you know, who are these people you're selling to who have the checkbooks and quite a lot of money to give you if you can get it right? Where do they shop? What are their water cooler conversations? What are the things that interest them? You know, what do they read? How old are they? You know, what's the kind of gender split? All that type of stuff. Where are you going to get that information? Some of it from statistical reports, but you'll get a massive amount of stuff like that from your, your salespeople if you, you know, if, if, if you listen to what they've got to tell you about those people. And sometimes they will come and banging on your cubicle door and saying, Look, listen, what really motivates my people is blah, 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 blah. Mm. On this topic, what I'm thinking about is from your experience. In terms of thought leadership content and anything that you've seen, particularly in your recent experience, that you think has been a really good example of thought leadership or a commitment to thought leadership in the e-learning space, regardless of what aspect of e-learning that is, is there anything that you can kind of pinpoint that comes top of mind for you? Um. Some people have done really good things on social media by getting, you know, particular interest groups going. Things like hashtag for women in learning, I thought was was a really mm-hmm. good one that several vendors participated in. And but it was around that particular issue. And there there was no sell involved in that of them, mm-hmm. but it, it was a very useful thing for bringing people together and exchanging thoughts, feelings information and so on and you could do that in a variety of ways i think i have to say i really like face-to-face events Um, i know we haven't had an awful lot of them recently i went to one that my sponsor learning pool did recently learning pool live which they do in london they've done it virtually for the last couple of years but i mean it was a great event because they bring in outside speakers and also speakers who know a lot about kind of learning theory and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they have an awards and a, there's a lot of interactivity, engagement with the community. Those things are great on all sorts of levels, I think, because you, you are, you're, you're educating the client, but then you're also letting them educate you and you're showing commitment and long-term commitment to that community. I'd say one thing 
which is a piece of marketing that perhaps I'm not sure if this does qualify as sort leadership, probably not. But when, when you, I was thinking about this question, there was an exhibition they used to go to every year and still do, Learning Technologies Exhibition at Excel, it's a major mm-hmm. UK show. And there was a company that went there a couple of years in a row and they booked two stands and one of them was their normal stand. Uh, and the other one across the aisle was in the name of a different company that was called Boring E-Learning. So you looked down the, the kind of show guide and you thought, what's this? Boring E-Learning. <laughs> and you went to this stand and it had hazard tape all over it and everything. It was a wrecked stand. And you thought, what is going on here? But it had the, you know, the nameplate, Boring E-Learning. What is going on here? And then someone attacked you on the shoulder and you turn around and it's a salesperson from, um, from the actual company who said, Boring e-learning is really rubbish, isn't it? Let me talk to you about how we do non-boring e-learning. Oh, and I think that what was really good about that was that it, it, it was an experience in yeah. 3D meat space, if you like. And it was just clever and funny. And it, it made you think and it disposed you well towards them and opened up for a conversation. So, I mean, that's not really thought leadership, but it's, it's very clever marketing. Yeah. No, I really like that example. Thanks for sharing that. And actually, um, you touched on something as you were talking there, learning theory. And earlier in the podcast, right at the beginning, you were talking about the evolution of technology and Moore's law. And I'm interested in, in the other side of things. So as you just said, learning behavior and maybe how us as a, a society have changed our approach to learning. Have there been any pivotal learning theory breakthroughs in the last 10 years that are interesting and things that you're studying? And I think just from my own curiosity, I'm just interested to know whether people's approach, particularly to blended learning, is changing in any way. Oh, several questions there. I think and, and the last 10 years, I think the last 20 to 30 years have been incredible, really, in learning theory. I mean, I should say great minds on learning. We, we start at the Greeks with Socrates, Plato, yeah. Aristotle, and go right the way through. We're doing the Enlightenment in this season. It's a multi-season project. So that's kind of more than 2,000 years, two 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 and a half thousand years, I think, of learning theory that we cover. But what Donald Clark says is that there's been more progress in change in pedagogy for learning in the last 20, 30 years than in the whole of that time. Wow. Um, and it's to do with cognitive science uh, through experimental psychology from the 60s onwards, taking over from behaviorism before that, which dominated psychology during the 20th century. So it's cognitive psychologists in the end of the 20th century, beginning of this century, now have a very strong lead on how exactly you learn. And then neuroscience has come into the mix as well. So, I mean, a lot of what uh, experimental psychology unveils is confirmed, again, from neuroscience, or they, they put an extra spin on it. And very often now, I'll end up doing webinars where I'm talking to a you know, behavioral psychologist and a neuroscience, and you'll say, right. what's the difference between you? And one of them will say, oh, well, that neuroscience, they do the gray squishy stuff, um, and we do the mind. So it's brain and mind. And we have more information now about how people learn. What we're discovering really is that technology isn't set up in a way currently that accords with the way that people learn. As I was hinting before, mm. it all happens through recalling and practicing the information and the knowledge later. That's how you get it into long-term memory. Everything we know now confirms that. Um, so there is a massive opportunity now ahead of us because the technology has advanced to the stage that we have all the tools to leverage what we know now about how people learn. The slight tragedy is that we're not doing it. But the opportunity is that the company that does is going to absolutely clean up. That's really interesting. It kind of leads me to the episode close, which is the future of e-learning and exactly this topic. So I'm interested to know, so how do we, how do we improve from here? We, as you said, we have all the tools available. And I told you at the beginning, my narrow mind just sees opportunity. I don't see anything else but a wealth of information. But it probably comes back to my question at the beginning, where I was questioning myself about my ability to then apply my learning is that I need to practice the things that I'm learning for it to stick. Absolutely. So what, what yeah, can, I, yeah I'm, I'm just, uh, just to hand over to you, well, what do you see as the future from here? Um, well, I, I think we, we're all going to be having to constantly reskill and get used to the, the fact that learning is part of our, our daily work or, in fact, work is part of our daily learning. You know, learning at work, work at learning. <laughs> um, 
and we're going to be aided in this. And, you know, I kind of sit at my desk with two computer screens in front of me um, and I'm learning at the same time as I'm doing and practicing. And, I, mm-hmm. you know, I've gone to lo- LinkedIn Learning, look at a course on um, sound editing, and I have Logic Open on the other screen. I'm actually trying to do what they're telling me to do because I know from, you know, my study that only by doing do you actually learn anything. Mm-hmm. And I think this will continuously be aided in the future. Obviously, AI is is with us already, and that will continue to come to help. You'll get more and more adaptive learning through AI, where the system that you're using knows where your weak points are and continuously, or at spaced intervals, presents to you the stuff that you need to kind of recap and go over again where your weak points are without annoying you, because we also have a lot of work going on on UX and UI. Um, virtual reality we'll probably see more of i think it and and it's good for kind of experimental stuff you know experimenting skills that you really have to do in the real world using your hands and feet but you don't want to do too often like you know flying a helicopter when you haven't learned yet or doing open heart surgery that kind of stuff We, we we'll see more routine use of that within workplaces but by and large they say it it's more about people getting to use the stuff we've already got. I'd, I'd like to kind of, as we're wrapping up, go back to what I was saying earlier about the sixes and just think, you know, a lot of the clever stuff was already there. The thing that needs to change is the mind shift for us to be able to use it in tandem with the stuff that we know from cognitive psychology and neuroscience. I have one more question now because you've triggered one final question from me. And I think I know the answer, but I want to hear your interpretation or uh, your response to this. For people out there that are listening to this that are interested, perhaps they, you know, maybe it's their own self-development or whether it's the development of a team and they're responsible, they're a learning manager. What would be your kind of takeaway piece of advice to support enhanced learning within businesses regardless of their type the number one takeaway for people to self-develop space practice i think is the thing it's the the ebbing house forgetting curve the ebbing house mm. forgetting curve you haven't come across it says that when you're presented with material or if you're watching a film even you will forget uh, within 20 minutes some of the, the time periods are slightly arbitrary but it it, it does hold true it's a uh, experiments that have been tested again and again within 20 minutes you'll forget 50 percent of it within an hour you'll probably forget another 20 percent and then within a day another portion within a week and then the curve flattens out so if you really want to avoid that forgetting curve you have to repractice and actively recall the things you've learned at periodic intervals a day afterwards a week afterwards a month afterwards. And if you can get into that rhythm in your own learning, you've got a really powerful tool for learning anything that you really want to commit to memory. But don't do it with stuff that you only do once a year or stuff that you, you're only doing for this month and want to forget. Forgetting is as important as learning. What a great way to close. But please don't forget where to find John and his podcast and all of the content that he produces around learning. So John, do you want to let our listeners know where they can find out more about you and maybe extend um, this conversation with you if they want to? Sure. Probably the easiest way to search up the learning hack on YouTube. Um, We have a channel there. And we also, I should say the podcasts are both audio and video, both of them. And on the YouTube channel, you get both Or as an audio podcast, you can access it wherever you get your podcasts. Most of our listeners are on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, but we do most of the other destinations as well. And on Twitter, I'm at John Helmer. Got that early, so I'm the only one there, apart from the American journalist who writes on Russia, and I get some very odd tweets as a result of that mistake. Uh, Or on LinkedIn, search me up on John Helmer, and I'll, I'll be in your face forever. (laughs) <laughs> brilliant uh, John thanks so much for your time today yeah, thanks so much for yeah. having me really enjoyed it oh no problem and uh, yeah listeners this has been the internet marketing podcast take care